Okay. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming and stopping by. We're going to get started in a few minutes, so sit back and relax. Okay, we'll give everyone about one more minute to settle in and then we'll start. Okay, everyone, let's, we're about to get started. All right, so, hello, and welcome to CNH Circle K's first district webinar of February 2019, Understanding Autism. So first off, let me introduce myself. So hello, I'm Jacob Wuming. I'm a fourth year mass media major and sociology minor at Cal State University, San Marcos. Woo, woo, paradise. I'm also currently the San Diego executive assistant in the past, I was the San Marcos's club secretary and club tech chair. A little fun fact about me, I, was, I managed to snag an Olive Garden pasta pass in 2017. It was quite the experience. Like, it was really cool getting to be able to go in and get pasta pretty much for free all the time, though the thing is you also have to plan your entire like schedule around Olive Garden as well. And as a student, it, I really had to like pick and choose like when I would be able to go to lunch for a few weeks. So all right, that's a little fun fact about me. So big, big forewarning here. I'm not a professional, nor do I have autism. So I'll be trying my best to speak up for them as a good ally and not spread any misinformation in this webinar. So why am I qualified to talk about this? Well, my younger brother, Ryan, has high functioning autism. That's him up there opening his Christmas present, which is a box of cookies. He loves food. I've known him for pretty much my entire life, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about is stuff I've learned from living with him for like 19 years now. Also, my mom is a special ed teacher. She's taught for almost five years now while raising both of us with my dad. She went to college to get her teaching degree, and while raising us, also wrote a little kid's book in the top right. So that's a neat thing. 
So what is autism? Well, according to the official Autism Society, autism is an umbrella term that basically affects how people learn and grow social skills. It can cause people to have difficulty communicating and living in an able-bodied world, whether it's having problems speaking at a reasonable level, understanding social cues, or being afraid of certain things. These traits can usually be identified at a pretty young age. My brother, for instance, was diagnosed around age five as we could, as he enjoyed lining toys up in a row. That's a common, common source for kids who might have autism. They love to line things up and make things match. Autism is a spectrum or a big web with a bunch of different little attributes under it. So basically not all individuals with autism have the same issues. Some are verbal and can talk all day. Some are nonverbal, which means they don't talk at all. Some are aware of per people's personal space. Some are not. Some are quicker than others. Some have trouble zipping up their jackets, etc. So it's not right to categorize like everyone under autism. Many people theorize that many brilliant minds like Einstein were on the autism spectrum. Things like Asperger's are also under the autism spectrum. Say my best friend also has Asperger's, for example. He's a little slower in getting social cues, though he also goes to Cal State San Marcos with me, and he's getting his degree in chemistry pretty soon. His tendencies, as he likes to call them, are a little bit more subdued and internal than my brother. So saying that someone has autism can mean like hundreds of different things. Again, my bro brother has high-functioning autism, meaning it really affects his basic living. He gets panic attacks when he or someone else loses something. Like there's, there was this one time where he freaked out because we, he forgot his toothbrush at our grandma's house. And he also really doesn't like when schedules change. Brian's most common phobias are about closed captioning on TV and languages other than English because he stresses out when they talk too fast. This obviously makes the world really difficult for him as he'd rather just sit home and play Minecraft all day. All right, so let's have a little fun question game right here. So for those of you in the live chat right now, I'm gonna have two of these in the, in the webinar. So pick the letter that you think is right and type in the chat. So according to the CDC, that's the Center of Disease Control, how many children are estimated to be identified with autism spectrum disorder? Like what are the chances? Is it A, one in 1002, B, one in 303, C, one in 59, D, one in 40, or E, one in 10. So I'll give y'all about mm, half a minute or so to type it in, in the chat and figure it out. All right, y'all feeling lucky? The answer was C. So as of last April, one in 59 children are identified to have some sort of autism-related disorder. It occurs in all identities all across the board and has been on the rise as more and more people are being diagnosed each year. All right, so if y'all didn't get the answer on the last one, let's see if you can get it on this one. So. What is the ratio of people with autism between boys and girls? Is it A, one to one, that means for every boy there's one girl. One to two, which means for every boy there's two girls. C, for three boys for every one girl. D, four boys for every one girl. Or E, seven boys for every one girl. So I'll give y'all another half minute or so.
Okay, time to move on. The answer to that was D. Boys are four times more likely to be diagnosed with autism than girls. Something's up with that Y chromosome, am I right? <laughs> and also about 10% of kids are also identified as having Down syndrome or other genetic and chromosomal disorders. And around half, 44% of children identified with ASD has average to above intellect ability. So important point here, people with autism are not inherently less smart than anyone else. Okay, so here's my general story with my brother. Ever since I was a kid, I noticed that my brother was a little different than others. He was very quiet and never really wanted to play with toys like the other kids. He also went to a different school system than me, which really confused me for a little bit. I was too young to understand the specifics, but even at a young age, I could already realize that Ryan and I were not traditional brothers. As we grew older, it kind of got me... It, mm. I kind of got better at understanding the little quirks and idiosyncrasies of people. It also made me a lot more cautious and patient in situations, at least compared to other guys back then. Fast forward to now, Ryan gets therapy three times a week, so we all pretty, we pretty much always have someone over at the house. He also goes to a free weekend program provided by the state, which helps him coping mechanisms and gets him out into the community. He also wears those big honking earphones on the left to keep himself calm. Ryan is a really bright guy though. He loves cooking and eating. He has perfect pitch and he can tune your guitar for you. He can also name like every Smurf by name. He's learned a lot since he was a kid though, but he still has a lot to learn. And it can honestly be really stressful, especially when they go out to places. I'll be honest, sometimes if he has a really bad day, it can be really unmotivating. He's almost 20 now, and if he doesn't make some serious changes, I'll be the one having to take care of him someday. He's my only brother, but I also don't want to sacrifice all of my adult life caring for him, you know? Because that really takes a toll on me as well. Now, if there is one thing I've learned about Ryan, it's that everyone has their own quirks. Everyone has their own strange, unique things about them. And some people might be better at hiding them than others, but we're all different at the end. Despite everything we do differently, we are still people after all. And hey, these experience got me to host this webinar. I figured my experiences might help out now, especially as it's one of our district, district service initiatives, which is to help people with disabilities. I remember reading about this as one of the proposed district service initiatives early on last year, and it meant a lot to me. So I remember like standing outside my college at night trying to type out like a big reason why this should be a DSI to my LTG. And this wasn't even on my computer, this was on my phone. My LTG bus was like, thanks, I'll, I'll pass it on in a bit. And hey, turned out to be official, so little beans. Anyway, so that's enough about me. So now I want to help you, the listener, by talking about a little bit of skills to help engage and connect to people with autism throughout the spectrum. A lot of these are basic social skills that we often take for granted, but it's a good reminder to keep everyone up to date. So first point, speaking slowly and clearly. This is something I struggle with a lot sometimes. So not everyone has the same grasp of language as you do. And this applies to everyone, not just people with disabilities. Not everyone grows up knowing English as their first language. Speaking of speaking, <laughs> some people have high functioning autism do get pretty loud and might try to like push you in some way to like express their emotions out and get out of the situation. As heated as it gets, don't try and engage in this by yelling back, because it might normalize the behavior for them, encouraging them to do, do more. Second point, being clear about personal space. Some people are pretty shy, and well, some are not. But if they do get close, or like put your arm around you, like I know many kids like to do, politely remind them about your personal space or your personal bubble. You can then then encourage more acceptable forms of contact like high fives, like those two are doing in the picture. Another thing to note is that many people with autism often fidget as a way of releasing energy or anxiety. This could be like flapping their hands or playing with a toy. This is okay. Like remember when fidget spinners were popular? They still kind of are. It's also like how some people like consciously or unconsciously like shake their leg when they're sitting down. That's fidgeting. That's like releasing energy. These are a little bit more specific things. 
If you see someone with a disability, like struggle with something, like trying to reach up something or zip up their jacket, ask if they need help first before just trying to jump in and do it for them. It gives them the chance to learn on their own. They might not even need help in the first place. They just might need a little bit of extra time. Next, in conversation, use the words people with autism rather than autistic. Now, if you've been noticing, I've been trying to make the effort to use people with autism rather than autistic. Because some communities might see that word as a slur or a taboo. And using the former puts the people part of them first. It can be a little hard to get used to, but it's a subtle linguistic touch. Lastly, some individuals on the spectrum often have people with them to help teach them social skills when they're outside in the community. For example, my brother has aides or people who go with him to like the grocery store or the mall, and they bring around like a big tablet to make note of what he's doing right and what he needs to work on. So if you're interacting with people who might have companions with them, talk to the individuals first as normal before speaking to the aide or other people. All right, so this is a part of my presentation where I flex a little bit about being a media major. <laughs> so as I was putting together this presentation, I realized there's much more media about autism than I realized. Like most things in the media, autism representation is highly, highly exaggerated. Now, don't get me wrong. It's really good to see people with these traits. Though, generally, the people with autism are generally look the same. They're all boys. And there's little diversity outside of that spectrum. Shows like Atypical and that Sheldon, that Sheldon show, and that's a tongue twister, illustrate that people with disabilities are in the mainstream, though sometimes they can be seen as a little bit of a joke. Yet they are also portrayed as really creative and really smart too. Like YouTuber Chugga Conroy down in the bottom does video game walkthroughs and has over a million subscribers. At the Old Globe in San Diego, they often perform at least one sensory-friendly showing of the Grinch to people with autism that might not be able to sit through a full theatric production. I want my family one year. They tone down the special effects a little bit and have a warning light that pops up for a loud noise. There's also a lot of books like The Curious Incident on Doc of the Dog in Nighttime eh, that follows the lives of youth on the spectrum, and that was also made into a play. That's the thing up top. In the middle picture of something I learned about a little recently, PBS Kids officially acknowledges Autism Awareness Month, that's in April, and several, several of its shows like Arthur and Sesame Street have episodes about kids on the spectrum. As an aside, I spent like so many hours on PBS Kids as a kid, so that was really cool to see it bring up more representation. All right, now I'd like to illustrate some of the service events that you can do to support individuals with autism. Lucky for us, Kiwanis already has its own organization for people with aut disabilities, and that's Action Club. Definitely search for if there's any active action clubs near you that you can collab with. Also, the Action Club website has a bunch of different online resources about disabilities that might be helpful to you. So check it out. You can also raise donations towards your local Action Club or your local special ed programs. Many special ed programs at schools are really underfunded, so. Any general school supplies would really help. Moreover, there's plenty of other service events to help those with disabilities. Some of these nonprofits include the Autism Society of America and the Star Institute. Also again, April, every April is Autism Awareness Month, so generally there's bound to be a bunch of events coming around this time of year. I think it's coming up in a few months. Also keep an eye out for events and nonprofits around your local city. There's plenty of orgs that need help su supporting people with disabilities in your area. You just got to ask around. Here's an example of a service event my club did. My club president worked for a local special ed program. And through that, she got us into an autism relay event that was on our college campus. We helped give out snacks and coffee to participants. Also, shout out to my president, Hanano Yamazaki. She helped me put a lot of this presentation together. So kudos to her. On the topic of autism communities, I want to give a quick word about Autism Speaks. Autism Speaks is one of the top organizations focused on autism advocacy and research. And I know one of San Marcos's sororities has Autism Speaks as their philanthropy and raises thousands of dollars from them each year. All right, for warning, again, I'm no expert, so don't quote me on this, but in my personal experiences and after talking to those who have been on the spectrum, 
autism community is not a big fan of Autism Speaks. Most of their money does go into marketing, awareness, and political lobbying, though not much of it goes towards those who like really need it like now and stuff. Like not a lot of it goes towards special ed teachers or resources or insurance bills. And raising someone on the spectrum is very, very expensive. A lot of the money goes into research claiming to look for a cure to autism, but that's arguably an ableist perspective since it gives the impression that these people need to be fixed and cured of their impairments rather than trying to help them grow and flourish and stuff as people. From what I've watched from their videos, some of their videos might illustrate people with autism as a burden or that they're a problem, often without even giving them a chance to speak. <laughs> Personally, I'd recommend putting your resources to another autism organization like Autism Society. So again, be mindful of the nonprofits you support, like any service program. This applies to like everything in the circle. Okay, so do your research. If anyone wants to help individuals with disabilities beyond your service events, there's plenty of different career paths that can do so. I know many of us college students here are looking for employment opportunities in the future. So I want to include a few of the jobs that my family has interacted with. These are also occupations that I know are in demand, so take note if you're on the job market. Behavioral specialists or behavioral interventionalists work directly one-on-one -on -one with kids to teach them social skills and prepare them for the outside world. They often travel to their client's house for a few hours or go out and teach them somewhere else, kind of like an after-school program. For us, it's called Applied Behavioral Analysis, or ABA. I know that orgs around San Diego look for behavioral specialists at the entry level, so it's a good way to get paid work experience in college. Like, one of my brother's specialists is legit my age at San Marcos. Many of them are usually psychology or sociology majors, so if you like working with kids, definitely check it out. Occupational therapists work with people to improve their physical, sensory, and mental systems, helping them adapt to everyday life. My family abbreviates it as OT. It's a little hard to explain though. Like say my brother needs to release energy from his body, whether by flapping or spinning around, and OT helped him find another outlet for that. Anyone can undergo OT at any age if they need help something. So you need a major's degree to get become an occupational therapist, usually in a bachelor's in health or in something related to kinesiology. Lastly, special ed teachers are, well, teachers who teach people with autism. They usually teach a similar curriculum to kids while also helping them adapt to a classroom environment. These teachers are specialized in autism and disabilities and teach them the fundamentals like math and science, but they don't need to be specialized in these subjects. They're specialized in teaching these subjects in a way to fit the kids' needs or the people's needs. Special ed teachers require similar prerequisites to any other teacher, though it might require a little bit more personal relationship with students. Also, special ed teachers usually don't teach at the college level. All right, so there's a lot more I could cover here, and I can't. I also don't want to mislead anyone, so I provide a few websites here for you to learn on your own. So the Autism Society of America is the first place I recommend you go to, as it branches out to many more of the topics than described here. Also, the Kiwanis Action Club, again, has a bunch of resources for facilitators and members who want to get involved into their community. And autismresource.com is simple and easy to remember. All right. Now, now I want to hear from you guys. I'd like to open the rest of the time for questions, so type it out in the chat, and I'll answer it as soon as it comes up to me. So, so type in your questions, and I'll see what I can do to try and answer them. Again, I can't answer everything, like because I'm not someone with autism, but I'll try my best. Okay, I have one question from the Q&A slides right before the webinar. So it asks, what is one thing to keep in mind when working with individuals with special needs? 
especially if it's a one-time service project or event. I would say to listen carefully and take your time speaking to them. We're student leaders, so we need to set a good example. To make, so make sure to communicate nice and clearly. If it's a one-time event, you might make a difference in their day if you make a good impression. So really put yourself out there and be a good listener and be patient. Another thing I would add is uh, sarcasm. Like, I know a lot of us here are, like, super sarcastic. A lot of people on the spectrum, like, legit don't get sarcasm. It's just a thing. So they might actually take you seriously if you make, like, a really sarcastic joke. Like, one of the things my brother is learning is how to understand idioms and sarcasm. So if you're going to an event, I try to tone down sarcasm a little bit when you're talking to them. Any other questions? Okay, here's one in the Here's one I have. Do you think girls are less likely to have autism or they are just diagnosed less due to a number of variables? I'm not totally sure about this. Like, I don't know, like, the genetics and bio biology le level about this. Like, there probably are some variables on, like, how boys and girls are, like, treated in school or, like, how often they're, like, put aside for, like, behavior and stuff, but I'm not totally sure how how girls are less likely to have autism. Like, I do know that there are girls with autism though. So it is possible. All right, here's another question. I currently work as an educator for a couple of students with autism, and they get really frustrated easily and very commonly throw temper tantrums. These tantrums are caused because they dislike when they don't understand concepts. I'm afraid they won't be promoted to high school next year because they recently became unwilling to cooperate. Do you have any recommendations on how to help them calm down once they reach that point of frustration? I'd make sure they have the opportunity to take a step back and calm down for a bit and try and think of other ways they can understand the concept like like different than the way you're teaching. You know, like everyone like learns differently and I do know that it is possible for people with autism to graduate high school. My brother did it. So it it is possible. You just need to find like some different ways, experiment a little bit and figure it out. But yeah, it can be really tough and sometimes they just need a little bit more time or they're having a bad day. Okay, here's another one. How would you address present Circle K members who have autism but were discriminated by their own club president because of it? Hmm. Now, this is a tough one. Well, Circle K, like as a whole, is meant it and it like is proud of itself for being an organization about diversity and honesty and like being accepting. But that should be its like number one priority that we need to remember. It might be worth it to talk to an advisor or a Kiwanis member about it who has a bit more experience about it since this is like discrimination, basically. So this is a serious thing. But definitely remember to tell like the people with the disability that it's not their fault at all and this they should be loved and accepted. And this goes to everyone, basically. But I would try to talk to an advisor or some someone about it, first of all. That's just what I would do.
How would you respectfully interact with someone on a spectrum without the accidental intention of like having a superiority complex? Just remember, like, first of all, that they're people too, like I said earlier. Like, sure, they might have difficulty learning or like have trouble with social skills. But remember that they're people too. So just remember they're a friend to you, like a friend who might like know some different things than you or might not like know as much as you yet, but they have the opportunity to learn and to grow. Like people, like they have a chance of being your, they want to be your friend generally. So just also just like acknowledge that you might mess up and don't feel afraid to apologize if you like mess up here and there because we all mess up a lot. Okay. What has been your hardest learning curve growing up with a brother with autism? So what has been the hardest thing for you to adjust to and how have you grown to overcome this? I would say like whenever we're like going out to like a restaurant or something or going out with friends and stuff, like sometimes like out of nowhere he can just like have a fit, like be super frustrated on something. And it can be really tough to like, respond to that when you're not expecting it. Like usually, usually we try to like foolproof ways to make sure he like does not react to things. Say we like give him earphones or we, if there's closed captioning, we sit in a way that he's not looking at closed captioning. So sometimes, sometimes like that doesn't work. Like sometimes like, again, he forgets his toothbrush and he like freaks out in the car. And it can be really, really tough to like not lose your cool. and. I'll be honest, sometimes I do like get mad. Sometimes I do like yell at them back if I'm like having a really hard day. Honestly, sometimes I just gotta remember that he is my brother too. Like sure, like we have like a general brother relationship. So I, I need to remember that, hey, he's helped me a lot and learn to, he's helped me become a lot more patient. Like he's helped me like understand a little bit more of where people are coming from and that people are just different. Now, so, again, it is really hard for me sometimes. And I don't know if that really answered the question super well, but sometimes I just need to remember that he is my brother at the end of the day, and I do love him, like, no matter how many times he, like, messes up <laughs> because he, like, sees, like, something crazy happen. Any other questions? All right, I'll give it give everyone like a few more minutes or so.
Okay. Someone asks, what does your brother want to do in the future? Ryan honestly wants to become a chef, personally. Like, he loves cooking things. Like, he's always, like, put, putting together these wacky recipes and stuff. Though he also really likes uh, coding. Though we haven't been able to find, like, that the good, best possible outlet for him yet on how to use it. Like, he also really likes music composition. So, like, he likes, like, mixing together some sounds together. Because he, he does play the piano. He does know, like, music and stuff. Now, personally, he hasn't thought, like, too much about his future. I don't think I mentioned it, but currently he used to work at CBS. So he, he did find a job. But currently he's not on that right now due to the behavioral stuff here and there. Well, what we want for him is we want him to work for my dad because he happens to run a little clinic and he can do like simple spreadsheet and data stuff, managing stuff. I don't think my brother has like a clear plan of like what he like really wants to do. Well, I think if he had the choice, he would choose to just like cook stuff all day. That's what he wanted to do, like big stuff. Any other questions? What is one thing you learned from your experience with growing up with your brother? And what would be your takeaway? I think early on, it taught me that families can be like really different from each other. Like I remember like with my friends, like seeing like, oh, they had like this kind of brother, they had this kind of sister, they had this kind of kid. And I'm, and I'm at a young age, I was like, my brother doesn't really like to do stuff with me. So I learned really early on, like how different like people can be. So it's kind of like made me better understand like a lot of different people growing up. Like my pe some people act like this, some people have this tick, something like that. So it's kind of taught me to be like really more accepting of different people with different like traits to them at a really young age. That's what I think it taught me generally. Has ASD or autism affected your career paths or goals? Um, I don't know about right now, though. It, it, I do often think about like sometimes someday I might have to take care of my brother when I'm older. And I think, what if it affects me like with a job? What if it affects me like finding a partner or another person or something like that? Or what if something happens to my parents and I have to take care of him? Like, my brother can, like, like he's not i i trust that my brother can live by himself under certain conditions so i do need to remember that he does need to be supervised from time to time to stop him from like accidentally like setting an alarm or something though i do know that when i was in kindergarten i was homeschooled in kindergarten so that my mom would have more time to tr train treat my or talk to and teach my brother so that kind of brought me into another sc different school system that was more homeschool focused. And that brought me up the, to the path where I am today. So if I didn't have my brother, I'd be in like a much more public school system. And that would definitely have changed my like overall career path. So just one of those like butterfly effects I occasionally think about. Oh well, yeah, because teaching someone of autism is, takes a lot more money than someone who doesn't obviously. So it can lead to some different situations where people get, need to get creative. All right, any other questions? I'll give it about like one more minute before we wrap up.
All right, that's about all the time we have for today. So thank you for listening. Thanks for for coming out. Make sure to sign in in this in the link com that should be going around in the comments, or just type in the link that's on the screen. Make sure you get those get those webinar hours. And if you have any other questions or comments, be sure to like shoot me a Facebook message because. I'm Jacob Wuming. I'm the only Jacob Wuming on Facebook, so it shouldn't be too hard to find me, you know? So, uh, anyway, so have a good night and good luck for everyone for the spring semester coming up and just keep on heading, keep on going.